I imagine you have a comment or a question for us. Would you like to do that? Yeah, I actually have like two burning questions. One of them is more burning than the other. I sent Oriad and I sent the accompanying Japanese poem Rain to my aunt, who's Japanese, my dad's Japanese. Um, and she studied English, so she is able to read it in English. And she told me, I just wanted to share her impressions. She felt like that the English, that Oriad was more focused on the actual language and the words. Um, she picked up on the imagist kind of sense that it was more about finding the precise words to describe what was happening, whereas she felt like the rain was more about um, creating an atmosphere through the words. Wow. I thought that was interesting. That is really cool. You know, um, you're referring to um, Nishiwaki's poem, Rain, uh, yes. Junzaburo Nik Nishiwaki's poem, Rain, which in Modpo Plus, part 12 of week three, we have, we have coupled with Oread because Nishiwaki was influenced by Oread. And we have a discussion with Andrew Hohen, who is in Tokyo and is a scholar of the relationship between American modernism and Japanese poetry after modernism. And so I'm just giving, giving a little context for people to know what that... So, what, so your, did you say your mom or your grandmother helped you with this? My aunt, my aunt, my yep. dad's sister. Okay. And so do, how, what do you have to say about this, I presume, somewhat new discovery that, that the relationship between imagism borrowing from Japanese poetry... Uh, with a whole lot of Orientalism intended and unintended, and then the influence in turn of later Japanese poetry from imagism. It's a complicated back and forth. And, you know, how, yeah. did, it, how did it feel to encounter that relationship through the Mod Po Plus stuff? I found it really fascinating. I mean, that was one of my questions, um, you know, I think anything that combines Japanese stuff and American stuff feels very relevant to me, obviously. Um, and so I was just devouring all of the material. But mm. I guess, I don't know, I read Kathy Park Hong's book, Minor Feelings, and in it she talks about um, how, as a poet, she has historically borrowed from Hawaiian pidgin and Spanglish, and nowadays she would probably not do such a thing because of our current kind of cultural climate and I was um, and then she talks about the difference between you know speaking about or speaking on behalf of people who aren't you know a, a, a people group who you aren't a part of that you aren't a part of um, yeah. Yeah. versus speaking nearby um, and I guess I was curious about that line you know, what other people thought about that line, where's the line between appropriation and cultural exchange? Because something she also says is that, like, you know, if we fully stay in our lanes, art will die. Um, yeah. And so personally, I think that it's a good thing that there's exchange of ideas, exchange of culture. Um, I guess appropriation is when um, maybe an, a, a, a people group in power are benefiting from maybe monetizing on yes. capitalizing on yes. another people group like culture yes um but that's a, i mean i don't have the answer myself but that's something i've been kind of wow. mulling over for the past you know six months since i read the book um wow. and i was curious about other people's thoughts shantine that's such a great topic um thank you so much i'm going to ask jake anna and amber rose to respond, I'm going to uh, f frame the question for them. But would you mind hanging up and listening to the answers offline or through the webcast? Not that a problem. Okay, thank you, Shantine. I hope I see you next week in office hours. You're a really great contributor, member of the Modpo community. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Shantine. Thanks, Al. Oh, Shantine is great. It's been so much fun getting to know her and seeing her contributions to the forums. Um, you know, this is the week where we need to talk about this, and I don't think we've talked about this quite as much as we should in Modpo over the years, guys, because 
we're dealing with, I mean, Shantine was talking about, well, if, you, if careers are made and if money is made. I mean, let's face it, Pound in particular, you know, dined out, as we say, on, the, on what he supposedly learned about Japanese uh, poetry through some, some pretty botched secondhand sources and some firsthand sources. And, you know, it, may, it became a big, big deal. Imagism was hot for 10 minutes, and a lot of it was borrowed. Uh, and yet, to add to complication, our section of three different comparison videos with a Japanese scholar who was a mod poer, uh, Anna was in on some of those conversations, maybe all of them, um, we learned that the appropriation of, the I of imagism from Japanese poetry actually influenced the post-World War II Japanese poetry poets who were trying to get out of fascism and back into a relationship with the West. And they used it as a liberating force. So um, let's talk about the, what you see in the syllabus poems. I don't want to go too far afield. Uh, uh, Jake, Anna, and Amber Rose, any comments on this whole issue? Jake, you first, please. Um yeah, that's a hard question. Uh, first of all, I, I just um, I want to start by maybe just opening two doors uh, to um, two things to think about. Like, first of all, I just want to hold up um, the comment about um, Minor Feelings, which is a fantastic uh, memoir, um, Kathy Park Hong's uh, memoir. And I, I remember one of the many things that stayed with me um, uh, from it was was a description that she had there of, of her uh, parents and and specifically her parents struggle uh, as, as immigrants um, Korean immigrants and and I what she said was uh, like all immigrants they were uh, they were survivors and like all survivors they were really shitty parents and all through the memoir there's kind of like the intensity um, that points to what you know what what this kind of writing this kind of poetry is about um just how much it matters how much uh the survival matters and how much they need to create the language that bridges across cultures that bridges uh across things like just how how important it is and the importance of, of of the bridges um when when it is when when it feels that important i feel like um then then that's that's completely worthwhile and 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 then th then that's that's that really matters and 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 that's one thing and the other door that i would open is um is um just uh, to bring up jerome rothenberg who's appeared in in various uh contexts in in, in modpo um on modpo and and jason taught uh something on, on on jerome rothenberg too and his concept of uh you know total translation what he calls total translation which is not kind of like easy borrowing or even translating but kind of translating that encapsulates um um you know just something something larger than 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 um than than just like an easy easy import uh but but is is is, is a really deep um exploration of of a culture that that it that it that it works with yeah and and you know that's this has been jerry rothenberg's project for many decades and it is a fine balance you have to do total translation or you're going to risk doing something very superficial and appropriative. I was just going to say, I mean, so one of the subplots of Modpo is like this Eastern influence on a lot of the work we do. So not only are we dealing with a lot of haikus here, there, I think there are some tankas in, in Modpo Plus. We also have a big Buddhist influence coming into the 50s, which we'll get into week five. I six, want to, week six. six? Week I don't six. Mm -hmm. Whenever beat week is. And, week um, six. So the influence is huge. And actually the Japanese American connection um, in poetry is like one of the biggest transnational poetic connections that we have in this, in a, in a surprisingly monolingual um, reading public in the US. Um, and the reason for that is that there's just a great history of translators of Japanese who are living and working um, in the US. But I think what's what's like most useful about the early Japanese tradition for the modernists is the kind of wide set of examples of how to place an image in a form in a kind of small scale. So um, this is why I think the haiku is so like useful to the imagists, right? In the sense that it, 
it condenses, it confines, but it also allows an image to kind of blossom, which is exactly the imagistic thing, right? Like that's the fetish is like make the image small and also so big because it's itself. And I think really the Japanese innovation in poetics at that time is like perfect for that. That's why it's a sort of perfect source for this. I think the question that, um, that uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the question asker's name. Shantine. Shantine asked at the end about appropriation. I think she kind of answered herself. So I'm gonna kind of wary away from it. But I will say like, as much as America tries to be a very monocultural item, it can't be, it like fails to be constantly. And I think it's interesting to kind of track these things. And I just wanted to like drop a little Sawako Nakayasu recommendation, who's like really thinking about like how this works and and why we do this and what translation is for and what is it like to leave things untranslated and what does it, what kind of pleasures does that produce? And I think her her recent work is an extension of exactly the tradition that Al was just talking about, which is the sort of Japanese response to the modernist response to the Japanese, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the poet that Gabby is talking about is Sawako Nakayasu. And there, I think we have some Sawako in Modpo Plus, but if not, it's going to happen soon because we're doing a poem talk. I want to hear briefly from Amber Rose on this topic. Jake and Gabby really gave such dynamic and, you know, just on par comments that I don't really have much to add. The only thing that I want to maybe that's coming to mind for me is about a is citational practice, um, which I think is kind of the step just beyond sort of the deep engagement, even the 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 total translation, which is to say reaching beyond the poem. How are you pulling in? the cultural context, the physical environment, the, the social, political, the sense and sounds, how are you trying to really attend to the whole atmosphere that created this poem, right? Mm, That's yeah. part of what total translation is trying to get at. And then the deep immersion and, and knowledge, you know, not just of the form, but of learning another culture, yes. But then the citational practice is really important because that's where you're pointing directly to the source and letting other folks know that as you are presenting your work that you're immediately pointing to its origin or pointing yeah. to a source for whom it, it, it feels like an origin, right? right? Yeah. And that piece is important because we are talking about cultural works that are like facing an audience. So it's not actually enough for you to have a deep sense within yourself. It's also about what are you presenting alongside your work and 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 where are you drawing or where are you pointing the energy back towards? So even in the case of William Carlos, the, uh, the person who rewrote the Williams Carlos Williams Tom, poem, Tom Leonard. it's effective because of that citational practice, because it cites the source. Yes. Great. Thank you, Ambrose, for adding that.